and we're live. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Dr. Hansen. How are you today? I'm doing good, thanks. How are you doing? Really good. Hey, I found another one of those, actually two more of those malicious compliance articles that you enjoyed so much last time, and I thought I could read it to you. Is that okay? Hey, sounds great. Let's go. Okay. Well, this first one is about a guy that the owner wouldn't let him go to jury duty. So it's humorous, although kind of sad too. Okay. Okay. So this was back in the 80s, my first job, working as a maintenance man at a local hotel. I'd been working there part-time since I was 16, and when I turned 18, I got a notice to attend jury duty. I picked a week, and I let my boss know. The owner of the hotel found out. He was always a completely unreasonable jerk to all the employees. Okay, obviously he wasn't well liked either if he calls him a jerk. Okay. <laughs> and sees me in the hallway and tells me that I need to do whatever it takes to get out of jury duty because he needs me at the hotel that week for a large dog show, clogged drains, etc. And if I'm not at work, I'm fired. Ooh, I, I don't know about the 1980s, but that's not legal to restrict an employee today so no it's not but he says i get selected to a week-long trial the judge asks jurors if there's any reason we cannot serve on the jury when they get to me i'm nervous never been in court before and too scared to lie i tell the judge that the owner of the business i work at will fire me if i'm not back today and said i needed to do everything i can to get out of jury duty or i'm fired the judge looks mad well yeah because it's an obligation. You're expected to be there. Sure. Absolutely. The judge has me approach the bench, ask for the name of the owner, location, etc. Then he hands me the court officer a paper and says something to the officer. Oh, no. About that time, <laughs> I bet the employee's saying, well, I'm fired anyway. Yeah. <laughs> About an hour later, the officer returns with the owner, visibly shaken, in handcuffs, and walk to the front of the judge's bench. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> The owner is standing in front of the judge. The judge asks him questions, which he tries to worm out of. Then the judge, looking even more mad, instructs him that I will be here for jury duty. I will serve as long as I need to, and he should not do anything to retaliate against me, and that the judge is filing charges and will be instructing the clerk to check with me regularly. If I'm fired or face any disciplinary action at work, he will hold the owner in contempt, and he will spend time behind bars. Then the judge makes him apologize to me in court. Oh, my, my. I, you know, I don't know that I'd be, feel comfortable going back to work, even if, you know, <laughs> even under those restrictions. But Absolutely. See. I don't know that I would either. He says, I made it onto the jury and I served the week. I reported back to work the following week. I expected some blowback, but I never got fired. None of my shifts were changed and I got paid for my time in jury. I didn't ask why I got paid. Of course not. <laughs> the clerk did check back a few times, and I was told to call the judge's clerk, direct phone number, if anything happened. It was awesome. I was pretty much bulletproof and worked until I saved enough to go back to school. Okay. Okay. Well, obviously the business owner learned what the judicial system was about and learned that that's not something you want to play with when an employee gets... Uh, called into jury duty. It is one of our uh, civic duties that we need to we need to be able to do when we're asked to do it. So I, I'm kind of glad it worked out this way and I'm kind of glad the kid was, uh, you know, kid 18 years old, I guess not much of a kid anymore, but that he was uh, at least had enough sense of mind to just tell the truth. That was good. Okay. Well, this next one is about uh, renting versus buying your equipment. Okay. Back in the days when 33.6K BPS modems were top of the line. Hmm. You remember those days? Uh, <laughs> the, the noise. I can remember the noise that they used to make. Yeah. I worked for the engineering department of a growing company. This company had started small. It was privately owned. And the VPs had, put in, uh, had all put in a portion of their own money to start the company. By this time in the story, they were finally making a respectable 30 to 40 million a year in profits. Oh, that's doing good. Yeah. But they still acted like a small com company, penny pinching. Well, yeah. You never quite know what's going to come around the corner. True, true. Our engineering department was designing circuit boards with embedded computer systems. Uh -huh. And to program these, instead of soldering the microcomputer to the board, we would solder on a microcontroller socket. 
and then plug in an in-circuit emulator that would pretend it was a microcontroller and allow the programmer to create the required program. Okay. This in-circuit emulator, or ICE, was made by Hitachi. It plugged into a free PCI slot on your PC and had a ribbon cable that would attach to the specialized microcontroller die that plugged into the socket. It cost $15,000. It was an absolute necessity for most of our most popular product lines, and there was only one of them. Only, only one? Only one, and we were renting it. It cost $4,000 a month. Okay. The first month we Wait, had it. You're saying it cost $15,000 to make? To buy. To buy, and $4,000 a month? To rent. Okay, so if you're a finance person, the ROI on that one is four months. I mean, four months, you'd pay $16,000. Okay, let's hear what the rest of it was. The first month we had it, our CTO and marketing VP planned our whole new product line around this family of microcontrollers. Okay. So at the end of the month, us engineers asked man management to buy this for us, since we would be using it for a while. The engineering VP saw the price tag and told us just to rent it. Engineers, being practical, forgot about the objection and just put our noses to the wheel. Right. They got their equipment. They doesn't care. They're not the finance people after yeah. all. And the CTO was making that decision. He didn't consult his finance people about that. Uh, when they get to that management level, they're supposed to know quite a bit about finance and about budgets and, you know, things such as that. He, he would have been taking a hit to his own budget. Well, and they had to make a guess how long they would be using it too. Yeah, maybe, but it sounded like they were going to use it for a good long time. Okay, so well, let's see what happens. The CTO and marketing made plans to keep us busy using this microcontroller line for a while. They pre-ordered a few million chips. Uh, that's quite a while. After a year, the VP of Finance asked us about this recurring contract line item. <laughs> the finance they, guy got involved eventually. <laughs> they called the engineer who had originally started the contract. Uh -huh. The engineer helpfully forwarded the approval from the engineering VP and his later email asking to buy it and the VP's reply where he demurred. By the end of the second week, this toy was ours. Along with the second one, since finance determined that product rollout was being affected by not enough access to the equipment. No one got fired or demoted. Oh, shucks. <laughs> but at the next department meeting, the engineering VP tried to tell us that we didn't have enough money to upgrade our PCs. That that <laughs> one engineer... <laughs> okay. That one engineer spoke up. Would 40000 cover it? <laughs> Ten months of renting that <laughs> stupid device when they could have saved $25,000 to buy it in the first place and then buy the second one, still saving $10,000. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, you know, sometimes the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And, and this, kind of, this one thing it illustrates the importance of finance being constantly engaged in the running of the business. Penny pinching is one thing. But when you don't have a finance person there that can employ all of the tools, you know, they're looking at a, a one-time cost of 15 versus a recurring cost of 4000 per month. You know, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that that would be a problem, but a CTO is not necessarily always focused on the finance. He's focused on the production and the immediate uh, impact of a decision. So, you know, you can kind of give the CTO a break here, but... He really should have been a little more collaborative and got his finance person involved. I mean, this was a good story about how things can get sideways uh, in a company when they're still trying to save money, and in this case, not doing so. So, hey, thanks for those two stories. That oh, good. not a problem. We'll All do right. this again. Uh, yeah, let's do it again. And hey, if you like this video, could you please help us grow the channel by hitting the subscribe button? And uh, we'll see you again later. Thanks.